Hey everybody, and welcome to another episode of Voices of Liberation. I'm your lovely host, Crystal Farmer Seagar, and today I have patience here with me. As you all know, on Voices of Liberation, we break bread together because it is communal and so ancestral to our communities. So patience, tell us a little bit about yourself, how your Afrofusion catering, right, mm -hmm. got started and why it's important for us to support your business. Thank you, Crystal. Um, well, my name is Patience Mube, and I am the owner of Afrofusion Catering. Um, I started it um, during the Black Lives Matter movement, you know, a, a few years ago. Um, I felt that there was a lot of wounds that, you know, all of us were carrying. And really, in my African culture, food is what brings us together, right, as a community. We get to break bread, like you said. We have those deep conversations. We get to share, we build community, right? And we build that camaraderie. We build that trust and we get to thrash out those difficult uh, things that are affecting our, our, you know, our community. And so that was my way of um, you know, extending my culture and trying to bring a little bit of healing, a little bit of unity to the Santa Papa community, which I love so much. That is beautiful to know that Afrofusion started out of activism, I which know, right? <laughs> so much of our work does. Yeah. Um, and so how do uh, people get in touch with you? How do they, you know, get business from Afrofusion or hire your business? Thank you. Uh, so we are on Instagram at Afrofusion Catering, Facebook at Afrofusion Catering as well. And if you would like to order, you can go on, on our website, www.afrofusion.com. Uh, afrofusions.com um, and also you can uh, email us orders uh, at afrofusions.com so thank you patience for being here today and let's go to the table so we can talk about the food that you brought awesome so excited to be feeding you guys yay, yay. <laughs> awesome so what you're eating tonight uh, ladies and gentlemen is my favorite some of my favorite favorite food um, I always say just because you're eating vegan food doesn't mean that the soul of the food has to come out of it, right? It's very hearty, very flavorful, very spicy. A butter bean curry, one of my all-time favorites, right? It's a butter beans. We eat them. They put them in, in ox tails in Southern Africa growing up. So I couldn't imagine ox tails without butter beans. So that's a butter bean curry in there. Um, you also have some chapati, which is a fusion of, you know, East Indian culture as well as African culture. Uh, we have a lot of East Indian influence um, in East Africa and Southern Africa as well. And my all time favorite mushrooms, right? Um, tonight I prepared them, just sauteed them in some olive oil, you know, some, some spices, so you've got spiced mushrooms there. And you also have sauteed spinach, right? So a little bit of green, a little bit of balance on your plate, but uh, enjoy. And if you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Welcome to the table. I always, I hate saying the table because I don't want to take away from like the red table talk, right? <laughs> so I'm not trying to take over, I guess. Welcome to the space. I'm glad you're here to enjoy this conversation with us and for our listeners to learn about both of you and your beautiful contributions in this community. So let's start off with some introductions. You know, who are you? Um, and whatever you want to uplift about what you've contributed to, to your individual work. Thank you. Take it away. Well, thank you, James. So I'm Lawanda Lyons Pruitt. I live in uh, northern Santa Barbara County, Santa Maria, and I'm president of the Santa Maria Lompoc branch of the NAACP, NAACP. National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. And I've been president since 2007. Um, I hail from Mississippi. I'm a, actually from the country. Um, proud, proud, proud daughter of slaves and I proudly stand on their shoulders. I give them all the, uh, all the dues, all the honor because they paid the ultimate price for me to sit here in this space today. 
Um, so what I bring to the table is I bring my history of my ancestors with me and I do the work that I do because they paid the ultimate price. You, you, you said daughter? Proud daughter. Wow. I didn't say daughter, proud daughter. Right. Yes. Right now, I was just getting the lineage because that's just one gender, like that's your, your parents, right? Well, I guess you could see, yeah, yeah, you're right. You're right. That's, that's, that's like, that, I, the, the reason I think it's important to point that out is just because of the, the time. People always try to say that slavery was so long ago and we're so far removed from it, but like, that hits home, like real close. That's deep. Thank you for sharing. Well, thank you. Yeah. Oh, who am I? Who am I? <laughs> um, now, a pleasure to be here. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, I'm James Joyce III. I've been here in the Santa Barbara community for a better part of a decade, uh, primarily working in public service. Uh, so I've worked at the state legislative level, both the assembly uh, and the Senate at the staff level. <clears throat> but uh, most notably for the past five years, uh, founder and creator of Coffee with a Black Guy. Uh, started off as a community initiative, holding space and conversation in the community about perspective and race. Uh, that's uh, uh, transitioned into uh, my full-time gig now and doing uh, consultations with uh, various organizations around the country, uh, but still steeped in just talking good conversations and authentic realness uh, 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 with folks who, who want to know. Uh, and so I've been doing that and just off the few weeks off of a uh, uh, a local mayoral run here in Santa Barbara, finished second place uh, with 27% uh, of the vote. Uh, and so uh, uh, still finding ways to give back to the community. Yeah, and James, do you know if there had been any black uh, mayoral candidates before you? There have been, but in, under a different setup, right? And so uh, I've actually spoken to uh, the widow of that, that individual, uh, Babatunde Faloye, who, who it was a different setup, so the, it, it was um, uh, all the city council members were at that time elected at large instead of district elections than we have now. And so uh, uh, he, he had run before and, and didn't secure that, but was on the city council. Um, before I decided to run, I, I was in close conversations with his widow, who now is back in town. I actually have been in conversations with Miss Akiva and she will be involved in some of our Black History Month programming. I, I'm so sorry. I heard about Baba Tunde, but I didn't get to share space with him. But I didn't know he ran for mayor. I thought he was just, I know he was the first black city council member, but, or Santa Barbara city council member, but I didn't know he ran. Yeah, it, I, I don't know all the specifics, but it's my understanding that at the time, the city council members elected the mayor as opposed to the mayor being elected by the, by the populace. And so there, there was, a, 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 like I said, a kind of a different situation. But uh, in speaking with her, I, 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 tap, I tip my hat to him as being the first black man to run for mayor in Santa Barbara. Uh, I was the, uh, the second. Wow, I didn't know that. Is that typical in districts to have a city council just elect the mayor, or is that just the setup in Santa Barbara? Well, yeah, it's, it's typical. Uh, like, for instance, the city of Ventura uh, to our south, their, their mayor is, is elected uh, from their city council. Um, other, other cities do that as well. It's just about how the city charter is laid out. Oh, I've heard about the city charter and how problematic <laughs> the city charters can be. How does one determine who goes by the, the charter system and what city doesn't? Is it based off of population? Or? It's largely based on how the city is founded. And so when the city uh, the city's established, so for instance, the newest city that we have in our area is Goleta. Uh, so when Goleta was founded, they had a, a choice in how they were gonna be governed. Um, and so that's a, that's a choice that you do. And then that, that's what that charter is. The charter is the governing document for that for the entity. And so the way that our city charter is laid out in the city of Santa Barbara, it's an 18 page charter. Um, you can read the whole thing um, and, and it, it lays it out. It gives you know, the majority of the power to the city administrator, uh, the city council and the, the mayor, like they, they're um, the governing body, uh, but they don't do the work or carry out the, the, the directions that, that are laid out. And so that's largely uh, de determined at the founding. And before we get in, a little bit different and shift the conversation. 
Could we change that? Could we not be a charter city anymore? Uh, you can. Um, I believe, and don't hold me to this, I believe it's a, it, that would have to go to the ballot. Uh, so the, uh, the voters would have to vote on a change in the charter. And I believe that a vote on the change of the charter would require a, a super majority as opposed to just a simple majority. Um, and so it can be done. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a pretty heavy lift. Uh, but changing that foundational document and, and altering that to better reflect what our community is now currently and what it will be in the future, I think that's a smart conversation to have. Well, we started it here and hopefully it continues. Thank you for context around that. Um, I really appreciate that. And congratulations for being the second black man at Santa Barbara to run for mayor. I mean, um, I'm sure you still feel as if it's a victory. I know many people are discussing it that way. Um, and I hope it's not the last time. Um, I know it's sometimes hard in terms of like staying in Santa Barbara, sustaining income here and right. <laughs> just being present. But I hope uh, this fueled you um, as it did other black folks in the community to continue to get out there. And it, it does, but you know, it, it doesn't have to be about me and it's never been about me. If it, like, as you said, has inspired other folks in the community, if they decide that they want to run for something in the future, my job is done. All I got to do is plant the seeds and, and, and I'm completely okay with that. That's wonderful. That is. Yeah, that's wonderful. And thank you for, I, hate to, I don't want to say thank you for your service. That sounds so, <laughs> y'all know, yeah. But yeah. thank you for your contributions <laughs> to, to this community. Thank so, you for being bold and courageous. Well, yeah. or, or, or silly. <laughs> now, bold thank and you. courageous. Yeah. No, yeah. I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say silly. It, it took a lot to, to run in that election. I'm sure it was. It was a lot on your mental health and just being in those spaces. So like Ms. Luana said, thank you for being courageous. You know, because that reminds me of uh, our ancestors, uh, particularly like during the civil rights movement. And um, they had, they were in the uh, churches, you know, hidden in the churches and they were strategizing and making plans uh, on who was gonna lead this, who was gonna lead that, like particularly like with Rosa Parks and Dr. King and so forth. Um, but they were bold and they were courageous even back then to be able to do that. You know, who's, who's gonna take the first step? And, and all the people, they followed along, which is kind of what uh, I anticipate will happen from you running the mayor, James. I anticipate that other uh, blacks will step up to the plate Absolutely. and, um, you know, said, well, hey, James did that. You know, I'll be bold and I'll be courageous and I'll go out there and see if I can make a difference. So can we look for your name on the ballot coming anytime soon? <laughs> <laughs> I, I see myself as a uh, foot soldier. I like being in the trenches and I like uh, being down there in the trenches and working for the good of my people from that level. Well, you, you've definitely established quite a positive reputation doing that because in, in the years I've been doing public service before I actually met you, your legacy preceded you uh, as somebody who I need to know, somebody who I need to connect with. And once I did, I said, aha, I got it. I got James, it. Thank you. Miss Luanda thank you. is a force. Yes. Thank I you. always tell her, can you give me some of that? I need some. <laughs> and then she'll say, Miss Crystal, you already got it. That's right. That's right. I, as speaking is an honor to be in this space with you, Miss Crystal. Um, you make me proud. So you do. You make me proud because, um, you know, you're my junior as Miss Simone likes to point out. And um, anyway, it just, it makes me proud to see that there's someone behind us and someone that's gonna continue uh, what needs to be done for all people. And thank you, thank you, thank you, Healing Justice, thank you, Miss Leticia, thank you, Miss Simone, Miss Mariah. Everybody involved, thank you. Thank you, thank you for, you know, I think both of you for 
just supporting us in our endeavors and allowing us to take up space in the ways we do. Because I know it's, it's, it's not for everyone, but we appreciate, we really do appreciate carrying the torch and we really do, you know, want to honor the work of our ancestors in this community because there's so much black history here. Um, which I kind of want to pivot the conversation because you mentioned about being president of the NAACP, okay? Um, and, you know, why is it important for you to, to do that work specifically within that organization? Because it has so much history, right? And so talk a little bit about, you know, tell our audience, what is the NAACP and why is it important for you to be involved? Well, the NAACP, we were found in 1909. And believe it or not, by some, I say, 53 good white people and seven African Americans. And we were found in response to the horrific, horrific lynching that was taking place all across the United States, uh, particularly in um, Springfield, Illinois. And um, black people, they call it lynching and they sanitize it and it doesn't sound so horrible when you say lynching. But you know, when you think that uh, just because of the color of your skin that uh, you really kidnapped at gunpoint and you, you know, just randomly selected and then you're taken out into the woods and actually what they would do is uh, sometimes have a public swear the women, the people, they would all gather around while uh, you're tied up, you know, you bind uh, your, your hands behind your back, uh, you know, your mouth is, uh, there's something, something over your mouth. And then, right, and then uh, maybe you're put on a horse or just maybe they just take that, take a rope, put it around your neck and just hang you from a tree until you die you know, break your neck in essence. Um, lyn lynching is just a sanitized version of something that was very, very brutal. And so here comes uh, some good white people and some African-Americans, including uh, w Dr. W.E. Du Bois, W.E.B. Du Bois. And they were so concerned about what was happening that they formed this organization called the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, NAACP, and the mission uh, was to ensure uh, political, economic, educational, um, um, I'm trying to, there's one more, I'm missing it. But for black people, you know, that we would have the same rights as anyone else. You know, that we would have a just society. And um, as a result of that, that was 1909, and we've just continued on that journey. Uh, at a time, it was found at a time when black people could not vote, men or women. Um, then we moved on, we progressed on to where black people you sat in the back of the bus, uh, even though you were dead tired, like Rosa Parks. And um, if a white person came along and the bus was full, then you had to give up your seat on the bus. And Rosa Parks decided one day that she wasn't gonna give up her seat on the bus. Although there was a person before Rosa Parks, uh, but they had- Pregnant teenager. Right, pregnant. but they had to be strategic. Like even, um, even for uh, Martin Luther King, when he was chosen to be the leader of the uh, Montgomery bus boycott, he was chosen because he was very charismatic, he was young, he didn't have like any run-ins with the laws and it didn't take much to have a run-in with the law. But um, they had to be strategic when they were in those, uh, in those uh, church basements. It wasn't Rosa Parks, they selected Rosa Parks because she was, a, before she was known for sitting the bus sit in, she was um, a journalist, a well, respected she a, journalist. She was a seamstress also. Mm -hmm. 
but she but was heavily involved in organizing in the, the NAACP. NAACP. It was yeah. very, there, the whole movement was strategic, and mm -hmm. I think that's left out of a lot of the conversations when Absolutely. we talk about history um, and uh, so many of these social justice movements from mm -hmm. the past is that there was a lot of strategy behind, and a lot of that organizing was in the church, right. the NAACP, right. um, and we even have historical roots to that in Santa Barbara with the George Washington Carver Club, the NAACP was really active here. Actually, me and Letitia's grandmother, we cried because our my great great grandmother and her great grandmother are in a picture together and they were in the George Washington Carver oh. Club. Oh. Yes, yeah, so it was almost like fate, oh, wow. you know, that we're wow. now organizing together. Like yeah. you can see the historical roots of um, organizing and how right. it was essential at that time. Right. You did not exist without organizing, whether, you know, the black people starting the food bank here or, you know, getting funds to open up the Franklin Center or right. starting so many of these welfare mm -hmm. systems. People forget a lot of that sprouted from black organizers out of the NAACP right. and out of the George Washington Carver Club. And, and the church, of course. And the church right. was essential to organizing. Right. Um, and that's why that's some of the reasons why we want to continue to carry that torch because then i almost think in terms of they didn't have a choice it was organize or die right right or stay hidden for the most part well i mean a lot of the existence even out on the west coast came out of a a, a need to exist it was you know the the, the great migration from the south uh, right. from all that torture that mm -hmm. you spoke about i mean I, I would be remiss if we didn't point out, okay, so the, the NAACP was founded in 1909, but that was on the heels of Reconstruction. Mm -hmm. after, after slavery was quote unquote abolished, black folks was like, all right, well, equal opportunities, we're gonna lean into this thing. More like immediately after slavery was abolished, there were more black folks in, in public office exactly. th than ever time in, in history. And that is kind of what led to the lynchings and the more it, it extended brutality that then the NACP was the answer to that, right? right? And so, right. I mean, I think one of the things about our history is we, we tend to talk about these things in isolated incidents without understanding the context in which what mm -hmm. leads up to them. Mm -hmm. We wouldn't have had uh, a mass quote unquote awakening post George Floyd had we not had Philando Castile, Alton Sterling, these other things, Ahmaud Aubrey, mm -hmm. like all of these other things mm -hmm. that were happening and that have kind of been uh, uh, um, slices along the along the the, the the loaf of bread for us um, to be able to get to where we are and to get this more widely known awareness um, it, 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 it's not it doesn't just happen oh I agree I agree yeah I totally agree yeah and with you both being I'm sure you can recognize now why I invited you both to this conversation and the many years you both put into public service um, what's coming up for me is how being black is political. Being black is political. And I see a lot of our community um, is uh, in some places, right, being organized to get out there and vote, like what we saw happen in Georgia, but in a lot of parts still, uh, specifically in this nation, are uh, getting away from politics and shying away from voting and, and showing up to the polls. And, you know, when thinking being black is political, what are ways that you two think that um, in today's time, right, with you having, um, with the historical context of the NAACP and you still being involved in today and you just coming off a mayoral election, what are some ways um, that people can get, in, specifically black people, can continue to get involved in ways that are healthy for them um, and certain things that they should be pushing for and what should non-black people specifically be pushing for in these political spaces for black people? Well, I, I mean, I think the, what you point out about not participating is one of the biggest problems. I mean, even in this, this local election, uh, you know, we're celebrating 47% voter turnout. Well, that means 53% of the people, the overwhelming majority, didn't participate in the process. Um, and so I think that's problematic. Anything that we can do to encourage folks to actually participate. I mean, for me, it's not about, oh, I believe in this system or my vote's gonna change this or that or the other. Nope. Your vote is simply your ticket to, of admission, right? If you are gonna complain about the fact that State Street is shut down, or if you're gonna complain about the fact that the, the red light is too long, or your trash is, whatever it is you're gonna be concerned about in your community, 
until you vote, you really don't have a leg to stand on. Now, once you vote, it doesn't mean that, that you're done, uh, but that's the start of it. And I think that, that if we can get more people to just participate in that alone, there's something about that psych, psych, uh, in your psyche that, that gives you a better sense of ownership to community. You look at people who, like communities that, that high, have high percentage of voter participation, they have higher percentage of participation in other aspects of their community, PTAs, uh, um, uh, neighborhood councils, uh, looking out for their neighbors. That's just the baseline as I see it, as making sure that you're connected to something outside of yourself. Uh, I, that, that for me is step one. I, I would agree with that. Um, if you don't vote, someone died that you and I, James, that we might have the opportunity to vote. And so we definitely have to take advantage of that. And we have to vote, even if you don't like voting, someone paid the ultimate price. They're in the cemetery. They died for that right to, to vote. And they fought and fought and fought until the Voting Rights Act was, was signed. And so, the one thing that we have to do is we definitely have to vote. And so we're out there and we're constantly trying to educate people about what that means, the power of voting. But along with, uh, with voting also comes to take advantage of education and the educational opportunities, because really that's your key. That's almost your key out of uh, the high rents in Santa Barbara, the high rents in Santa Maria, so that maybe you don't, not that I have anything against Lompoc, but a lot of people, a lot of blacks are moving to Lompoc because Lompoc has the lowest rent in Santa Barbara County. Now, if you have the education, um, maybe that will eventually lead a good job and with that good job will come the earning power um, that will help you so that you know you you won't mind paying three and four thousand dollars a month uh, for rent or for a loan i also think a lot of that is just leaning into being black right like like you know that whole concept of you know, okay, yeah, I ran for mayor, but now hopefully somebody else is gonna be inspired. It's all about leaning into your blackness and, and our numbers are small, but when I walk down the street, there's no question I'm a black man, right? And, and, and so I'm not gonna try to dance around that. Like, we're gonna be real about that. And, and you're gonna, this community is gonna know what that means, right? And, and sometimes that means we're not, the conversation, we just had a whole three hour conversation and not a word about race came up. The next day we have a conversation that may be all we talk about. Well, that's our existence, right? Some mm -hmm. days it can be right up in your face and you have to deal with it. Other days you can just go on with your life and quote unquote, uh, uh, just live, right? But uh, at the end of the, the, uh, end of the day, it, it's really about leaning in to who you are so you can be best person who you can be in the community. I agree, I agree. Wow, I love I would love to have this conversation with y'all for hours because it's so beautiful. Um, and there will be a continuation because we, we just need to talk about these things. More food. Yeah. Right, more yeah, food. It's, it's, I, only, I feel like we're just smashing the surface, we're, really. <laughs> we're, really we are. And um, I would love to have you both here again to continue this conversation. But we, of course, have our time constraints on, on, on our episodes. I'm just thankful for you both. Um, coming into our space and being a part of, I would say, Healing Justice's baby, which is Voices of Liberation and branching off in this way um, to continue to do this work, right? Because activism looks so, it looks different. It, it, it varies. Um, and so I really just appreciate you in, in this space. And really quickly before we end, how can people, you know, follow your work or, or tap into what you're doing? Well, my thing is you, you got to get involved and you gotta stay involved. That's black people, that's brown people, that's indigenous people, that's AAPI. But you gotta get involved and you gotta stay involved. Then along with that is we need, we need everybody to stand with us. 
the work will not continue like the George Floyd when um, that, I call him the ETS officer, when he had his knee on his neck for nine minutes and 29 seconds, the way that not only was it videotaped, but everybody, most people were just as outraged as we were. We've been outraged for a long time by Philandro Castile, uh, Micah Brown, um, uh, my little boy with the hoodie, and I can't remember Trayvon, his name. Trayvon, Sandra Bland. Sandra Bland. We've been out, right, we, we've been outraged for years, but it wasn't until everyone became just as outraged as we were and stood with us did it make a difference. And so we need our friends, we need all people to continue to stand with us. And by standing with you, I've already, uh, I've got my membership, but my membership to the NAAC, was it $30 a year? $30 a year. Yeah. yeah. $30 a year. Become and a member. If, and if you can't afford to pay it, uh, we can find a way for you to volunteer and to uh, pay that membership for you. Mm -hmm. I will personally pay that membership. <laughs> Not everybody, no. <laughs> no, we got Those it. Who, are, who, are, who are truly, uh, committed to the struggle. Indeed, 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 no, thank you. Um, as for me, uh, the work I've been doing with Coffee with a Black Guy, that's gonna continue. Um, I've got the website, coffeewithablackguy.com. If you can't remember that, cwabg.com. Um, we've got uh, 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 a lot of different events going on, both public and private facing. Uh, if you're, you're you know, a decision maker in a company, hit me up, let's, let's talk about how to have these conversations within your group. Uh, if you're somebody who wants to do that in the community, we can have that conversation just the same. And so CWABG on all the social media and all of that stuff as well. But you know, be out there doing this work and you know, connecting with other established community organizations to make sure that we're, we're, we're moving things forward. Well, thank you both for thank coming. You. Can thank I hold, you. can I grab Absolutely. some hands? Can we grab, can we, can we grab Yay. hands? Yay. I so appreciate you both for joining us in our space. And thank you all for tuning in to Voices of Liberation.